often citizen-led housing focuses on the glitzy new build projects all across the country, the co-housing schemes that are, have you know fancy architects and and and, uh, and start to sort of draw together new learning for for how new build can be. But actually, the bulk of citizen-led housing uh, across the country is tenant management organisations, established housing co-ops, organisations retrofitting homes, and so it's made up of both pieces. And so what we wanted to do was showcase where New Build is doing some fantastic things around low carbon housing. But we also want to have a conversation about how the massive retrofit challenge ahead of us could make use of new approaches to organizing people, new building techniques uh, and community energy. So we're gonna have some breakout rooms around those in the second half of this session. So I'm, I'm partially hosting this today with, with Chris Brown from Igloo Regeneration, who's gonna set the scene for us and hold this first discussion up to the break just before 11. And we're very lucky to have Sue Riddleston from Bioregional and Sarah Featherston from Velocity, uh, who's going to talk through some of the schemes that they've been working on, uh, both you know, existing and, and some new stuff that's coming up now as well. And I'll pop back in just before the uh, five minute break at 11 to tell you about, well, I'll, I'll pop back in to have the break at uh, five minutes to 11. And then at 11, I'll come back in and tell you about the three breakout sessions. So from here, I'll hand over to Chris. Um, oh, just before we go, actually, uh, we're gonna be recording this session. So if you don't want your to be on that video, we really encourage you to put your video on so you can participate. If you don't want to be on, uh, you can turn it off now because we're gonna press record. Uh, so I'll hand over to Chris uh, from Igloo Regeneration. Charlie, just before you disappear, can I just check if you're coming back in for Q&A as well at the end? Yeah, I'll hear that. <laughs> Good, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, as you heard, Charlie's asked me to do uh, a few minutes scene setting. It's a huge honour to be here, and I'm really excited to hear from Sue on the project she's involved with uh, over a, a number of years now, Bedsled and, and Chum more recently, and Sarah on Velo City, which is genuinely one of the most exciting innovations in development for a long time. Uh, and, I, you know, I, I follow both organisations uh, really closely because they're both doing some fantastic, exciting, groundbreaking work. Um, some of you will know me uh, and Igloo Community Builders from the work we do helping community groups to deliver community-led housing. What you probably don't know is I also have the um, decidedly over grandiose uh, and purely temporary title of uh, Climate Ambassador for the Built Environment to, to COP26. Um, I know you'll all be aware of the climate emergency. It's kind of, it's kind of thankfully now impossible to avoid. Um, and, and through this morning session, you're gonna hear from some great people who can help us navigate this, this territory. Uh, it's, it's a huge challenge, but, but it also brings lots of opportunities. So I think um, in this first part, buildings and mobility are the two big areas that we'll be covering this morning. Um, Sarah in particular will be covering mobility, so I'm not, I'm not going to say much on that, but just to mention one thing which, um, which came out of some of the, the other work I've been doing recently. Um, if you have a home which has got two big SUVs on the drive, the SUVs are about 10 times more damaging to the planet than the home is. And that, that includes building the SUVs and building the home. So, uh, so listen very carefully to, to Sarah, because we've got to do something about the SUVs. Um, carbon from cars hasn't been going down uh, since 2016 in the same way that pretty much everything else has. And that's just because of SUVs. What I want to cover, um, and it's just a few words, is uh, the buildings. So the, the, the two challenges, first retrofit, uh, which is um, by far and away our, our biggest challenge, uh, and second new build, uh, and in particular on new build, it's, it's the materials, the upfront carbon when we build new homes, which is the, which is the biggest challenge. So starting with retrofit of existing homes, um, <clears throat> I like to try and, and, and simplify the challenges. So 
we've probably got to insulate around 17 million homes. Um, probably we've got to do most of that by 2030. Uh, and we've got to take them so that the minimum is an EPC C rating. And, and for, for positioning, the, the current average for a home in this country is a D uh, and a new build is usually a B. Um, and once we've done that, we have to do that because we need to replace the gas boilers with probably air source heat pumps, which will be powered by a, a decarbonized electricity grid. And the forecasts for that are that by 2035, the, the electricity grid will be 95 to 98% low carbon. Um, but it's going to have to be a lot bigger because we're trying to put the cars and the homes onto it. So that's, that's the kind of simple thing government's doing going going to do isn't doing yet is going to do quite a few things to make that happen they're going to legislate through the minimum energy efficiency standards so that will require all our homes to be east pc c by 2035 um, and it's earlier for rented homes uh, 2025 and 2028 uh, and for affordable homes where it's 2030 so this is coming um, they're also going to provide subsidy, but you'll all have seen that they just failed with their Green Homes Grant. Um, it's one of a long line of failures, government policy failures in this space, top down, imposed, designed in a rush, one size fits all, and now scrapped. They'll have another go at it later this year. Um, so there will be, be money to help us. And I think probably they'll start raising the price of gas and reducing the price of electricity because at the moment they tax it the other way around so there'll be incentives as well as sticks retrofit really isn't easy it isn't economically rational because the savings take ages to repay the upfront cost it's a lot of hassle and disruption people are worried that they won't find trustworthy builders they've all heard about cowboy builders and for me that's where community organizing comes in um, in particular, the hardest area is the able to pay owner occupiers. Um, they're actually the hardest people to persuade to take on these projects. Uh, and it often happens through street level and neighborhood level community action. Uh, and if you want a, an example to, to follow, I've always been really impressed by um, Cambridge Open Eco Homes who do fantastic city level advocacy and, and support and uh, it really making a difference in, in Cambridge. So question for you all this morning, um, how can community groups best help support retrofit? I think, that's, I think that's really a challenge for the sector. And then just the second part, the new build challenge, that, that's quite different. Um, we know how to build to EPCA, which is approaching zero carbon in use. We do lots of insulation. We make the home airtight. We put a clever ventilation system in where the warm air going out heats the fresh air coming in. Um, our challenge really now is how and where, which Sarah will cover, do we build them in a way that doesn't trash the planet? Um, again, in simple terms, it's easy. It, we stop using things like concrete, brick, uh, foam insulation is, is a really, really bad one. Uh, and instead we use local sustainable timber and natural insulation materials like straw and hemp and wool. And we'll still have to offset the rest by paying other people to reduce their greenhouse gases. But, but, but we know kind of the route that we have to follow. The alternative to that is we just build fewer homes or, or we convert the homes we have to better fit people's housing needs. Um, you'll all know of uh, Danny Dawling, one of Oxford's professors. Um, he's identified that across the country, on average, we all have two rooms each, which he would argue is, is one too many. Um, so there is definitely a better fit thing to be done there. But sticking to what we call the, the upfront carbon from building a home. Um, that's the big new build challenge. Uh, and I thought I'd give you an example that I really like for that as well. There's, there's a project called Homegrown Homes from an organization called Wood Knowledge Wales. 
And what they've done is they've looked at the entire timber supply chain in Wales, and they're working with all the stakeholders from the forests right the way through to uh, the builders to find practical ways to minimize the upfront carbon in new homes. It's a really exciting way of going about it. So my new build question for you all today, um, for everyone who's thinking about building new homes, is how, how can the community-led home sector show the construction industry the best ways to minimize upfront carbon? Um, and now I think I'll hand straight over to Sue, is that right? Sue, you're on mute. Thanks very much, Chris, uh, and a great sort of tour there around uh, all of the issues uh, that we, we're facing. Uh, I'm just going to share my screen with you. I've got a few, a few slides just to illustrate it for you. Um, so uh, our topic, designing sustainable housing with communities. And I think for me, it's all about how are we designing to make it easy for people to live a sustainable lifestyle? Because we don't get up in the morning and think, oh, I'm, I'm going to cause climate change and you know all of these things. It's just we're all in this society that we've created together. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about our approach um, to, to doing that in, in the housing sector and uh, how we've been a community-led housing group in effect and uh, also how we work with um, community-led housing groups for designing sustainable housing with communities. So um, by regional, we, we've been going since 1994 um, and very much um, working, especially we started out working particularly on products and closed loop circular economy products and then we needed a new office. Um, so I thought, oh, maybe we could build a green office um, and that led to us um, actually um, looking for sites, um, finding a, a green architect, take, taking the project around um, to see if there would be anyone who'd put up the money to do it, uh, asking the local authority, did they have some land? Uh, and luckily they had actually made um, in, their in their local plan as it was at the time, they had said, we'd like to have an eco-friendly housing development. So that ticked that box. And I think with these things, it's always important if there's something in it for everyone. Um, and uh, we went around, you know, presenting to people and the Peabody, uh, a housing association, London's largest and oldest, liked the vision of the project, especially because fuel poverty was an issue for them with their residents, which means, you know, if you're on a low income, then, and your energy bills are high, it's a much greater proportion of your income. And so, um, you know, you may not be able to have the heating on or you may not be able to pay your rent. So that was, again, you know, it needs to be something in it for them. And that was what was in it for them. I think also they really liked the sort of approach that we were taking and the sort of community, community of that was being presented to them that it was coming from uh, a local organisation. You know, this is just down the road from where I used to live. It was literally from the community. Uh, and I think because we were deep green environmentalists, we were just, we were brought a different approach to it. We were thinking very much about how we were going to live there, how we were going to work there. And um, so I think that was something new that we brought to it because I think at the time people were very much about just, you know, how do we save energy in the buildings? And in fact, people didn't really talk about it that much at the time. Um, so, you know, we had all these different strategies um, obviously we wanted it to be zero carbon, but we also thought about, um, and you can see there the photovoltaics and there's a, uh, energy system. And we, we thought about, oh, where can we get the energy from? Um, once we've got to a sort of passive house level of design, uh, it's not passive house certified, but it's all passive house levels of, um, uh, energy demand. So, um, we've, used wood chip at the time, we probably wouldn't, and a district heating system, we probably wouldn't do that again. These days we're looking at um, heat pumps and more, more all electric and keeping the demand down. Um, we looked at the building materials, you know, how, how can you reduce the impact, as Chris said, so we used local brick from um, Cranley in Surrey, we used green oak weatherboarding, and in fact, although it looks quite space age, 
these were the local materials. And if you look around at the really old houses locally, that's what people always used to use. It's so much lower impact than lots of uh, steel. And we got reclaimed steel from the demolition site, which is a 97, 99% reduction in the life cycle impact. We just shot blasted it and spray painted it. Um, we claim paving, all sorts of things to reduce the construction impacts. Um, and transport, you know, you use as much energy, as Chris said, use as much energy for your cars uh, as you do uh, heating the home. So making it easy for people not to need to use a car. So we had, we had the first car clubs in England. Uh, we've got a space to put a bicycle inside every house. Um, and I've got an e-bike now, which is brilliant. And I haven't owned a car for 20 years. Obviously location is important. It's, so when you're thinking about sites to build in, in Thames Valley, you know, making sure it's near to some public transport, some infrastructure like shops, uh, everyday facilities and schools. It's no good building in the middle of nowhere and relying on uh, electric cars. Um, and we also um, were very much about, um, you know, incorporating nature. So we've got uh, roof gardens with, with lots of uh, planting. Uh, we preserved the ditch around and um, created a community garden and field. Um, and, and really we were just thinking about every aspect of, of a person's lifestyle, how to make it easy for them. And uh, what we found, this was 20, 20 years ago next year, and um, what we found was people can get reduce their impact, uh, but what they said was we really like uh, living here. We really like the community and the lifestyle. The kids can go out to play because it's reduced the roads, reduced the parking. Um, we've got half as much car parking as was required in the planning uh, rules at the time. Um, and uh, we've got, you know, a 50% reduction in car use. We're zero carbon. And yet people really love living here. It's paved in the middle. The kids can go out to play. And it's been so lovely. Some of the teenagers who've grown up here saying what a wonderful childhood they've had living here and it's, it's just a fantastic great sense of community and I haven't felt lonely in the lockdown because um, I can see my neighbours, um, we can, somebody built pet benches out of pallets on the field um, so we could sort of sit socially distanced and see people, uh, it's just been really, it's just a really great place to live. And then after we did bed said um, everybody beat a path to our door, we had, you know, we've had the Chinese Minister of Construction, we've had all the Prime Ministers, David Cameron, Theresa May, Boris, they've all been here. Um, and so we systematised what we do into what we call into One Planet Living, which is a framework which sort of picks up on all those points of design points that I mentioned. And it's very much coming from the perspective of us as people because it's people that are causing all this damage to the climate and it's our lives and the way we live that's causing this damage. So we just need to redesign our lives and have this different approach. And I, I think what I've certainly personally experienced is that that's actually a better life anyway. Um, so no need to be scared of it, it's something we can run towards rather than run away from. Um, so One Planet Living has all of these principles from zero carbon through to health and happiness. Um, it's open source and free to use. Um, we offer training. It's got lots of resources behind it all on our website. And it's this idea that if everyone consumed as much as we do in Europe, we'd need three planets worth of resources to support us. If you count not just the carbon, but also the, um, the stuff, basically trees, fish, um, land, you know, to grow food, uh, all of that, the embodied impact of all the stuff. Uh, so what we need is one planet living, uh, where we live happy, healthy lives within the natural limits of our planet. So any project we work on, we use this framework, we train others to use it and it's freely available and it's been used all around the world. Um, we started out using it for new build and then we found, oh, it can be used uh, for retrofit. It can be used by companies. It's been used by B&Q, for example, um, where we built projects so here in Sutton and down in Brighton um, and, and around, um, we found the local authority wanted to start using it. So in Thames Valley, um, we've been working on the Vista Eco Town for many years now. We have a whole team working in Oxford and um, have indeed been working with uh, Green Corps, who you can hear from Ian later. Um, and with, obviously with Transition by Design as well. Um, 
and uh, they've taken on One Planet Oxfordshire and that's been a great way for people to sort of work together and because it's about people and it's, it's, it's a cross-sector framework. So um, with community-led housing groups working with transition by design, we particularly developed what we call One Planet Affordable Living, uh, OPAL, um, and so transition by design and bioregional can offer support to community groups uh, to make your project sustainable. And I don't know if that will come up in, in the next session. Um, but um, we also work as an enabling developer. Um, so we have a partnership with Hill Group who build a lot of social housing. They offer homes for the homeless. Um, they're a really good family values house builder. So we can therefore sort of offer um, <clears throat> working with community groups from sort of securing the land all the way through to financing the project, had to handing over the keys um, and collaborating to get the homes that uh, community groups want. And this really started because we, we were working with a community led housing group in Oxford and they asked us to help um, secure a site that was going to go out to a big developer and, and we just saw all the problems and issues that uh, community-led housing groups face when they want to try and do that. So, um, and the other issue that was very important to us was making it affordable. So um, we did a lot of work and spent a lot of time talking to Charlie, I still talk to him about it now. How can we make it affordable visiting projects like the um, uh, Le Lilac in Leeds, looking at their model. And we ended up with a sort of discount market sale model. So to try to get the land for a fair price, so we work out the appraisal based on um, what people can actually afford uh, uh, based on their income um, and then um, secure the discounts on, on uh, through a community land trust through the community land trust uh, at the end uh, and uh, in fact what we're having to do on on a real life project which is Jobham is actually um, secure that through the section 106 agreement so um, somebody asked me in the chat has the Jobham project going so um I'll tell you a moment, I'm nearly there. Um, so we very much, with Chobham, it was actually the landowner that came to us, but we did know some people who lived in Chobham. So we said, do you think you need a sustainable, affordable community on this bit of land? And they said, yes. Um, so we had about 44 um, people who would come along to meetings. We worked with uh, War Thistleton Architects. Um, you know, it was a very collaborative co-creating and actually we had the neighbours involved as well even though the neighbours actually objected to our planning application because they didn't want anything built, they did contribute and they say, oh, well, we walk our dogs through there or we need to go to the bus stop here. So we've ended up with, if we do get planning permission, which we should hear about in June, we've actually had to go to appeal uh, because the council just want regular social housing there. Um, that was the, the P objection. Um, but if we if we get it on, a, on appeal, then um, it, it will be something that uh, fits in with the local community much better than if we just sort of turned up and did our standard designs and people really need this and, and want to want to live there um, we think about nature so you know every site is different and we want to make a home for nature as much as for people there's a lot of trees around this site because it's been derelict for a long time so keeping most of the trees concentrating the homes in the middle and you know enabling neighborliness they're zero carbon um, car sharing, e-biking it to the station, you know, thinking about how to enable a sustainable lifestyle. So fingers crossed for us and our sustaining job and community interest company <laughs> that we get planning and uh, look forward to your questions in the discussion. Thank you. And back, I think I'm handing over to Sarah. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm Sarah. Um, and uh, very pleased to be invited to partake in this session. It's super interesting. Um, so contrary to what the name suggests, Velo City is actually about rural issues um, and it's a vision on how we can provide new homes with better connectivity. And I'm trying to move the slide on. Uh, and the Velo City team is uh, friends that enjoy cycling together, 
but came together professionally um, to uh, put forward a proposal for the National Infrastructure, Com Com National Infrastructure Commission competition, which was looking at how new infrastructure along the Oxford Cambridge corridor would integrate with new homes and that idea of placemaking. Uh, and instead of um, looking at town expansions um, and new towns, we were very interested in, in looking at villages um, and, um, and uh, because they're existing places with a very strong character and because also they're actually suffering from quite a few issues, um, increasing congestion, isolation, car dependency. And, um, and in addition to that, um, uh, there is development happening in villages, uh, but it's not necessarily the right kind of development. It's what we see as sort of small scale, low density suburban sprawl. And the worry is, is that if you allow that to continue, villages will lose their identity as they sprawl out and could join with another village. So our idea is, is that you can start looking at doing uh, housing in uh, a higher density, a gentle density within villages. Um, and so why focus on villages? Well, the opportunity um, is there because there's a huge pressure on housing um, and uh, especially through co uh, during COVID, uh, there are more people working from home and we're seeing an increased number of people moving to the countryside. And in fact, there's over 10,000 villages in England and so many of those are probably only one or two miles apart from each other, which means that it isn't that difficult to start uh, applying this kind of fine grain infrastructure of cycling and walking to better connect these villages. And so Velocity has five key principles. The first one is people over cars, prior, you know, decentralizing car use and prior, prioritizing active travel. Uh, the second is compact not sprawl, this idea of trying to keep the special character of our villages by uh, um, looking at um, uh, building within villages and keeping them more compact and more walkable. It's also about connected, not isolated. So it's not just focusing on one village. Um, it's actually looking at villages as a cluster, as a group. By growing them together, they will have a sufficient population to support and bring back some of those services they've lost. The, the, the school, the pub, the bus service, um, all those things can begin to be um, uh, shared and, uh, and supported if, if you look at them as a cluster, as a group of villages. Uh, and um, it, this is also opportunity to bring in new kinds of housing. So we have a range that can, uh, and, and, and workspaces so that we can have both younger people living alongside older people. Um, and, and also it's, uh, it's time to um, look at the ways in which we can um, release land that we might not have previously been able to develop upon. And overall, um, throughout our strategy, it's, it's about protecting the landscape um, and increasing biodiversity, uh, promoting sustainable environments and also communities for health, their health and well-being. So when we looked at the um, Oxford to Cambridge corridor, um, we noticed that there were hundreds of little villages all along um, this corridor that were probably only about seven miles. Many of them were only about seven miles away from what would be a town with a new train station and links to this new high-speed rail and, and bus services. Um, and um, that meant that we could start looking at ways in which you could combine that kind of slow travel with the fast travel. So by um, looking at these clusters of villages that were perhaps only 10, 15 minute cycle away from the uh, town with the station, um, we, would also, we would connect them through opening up and reusing the old bridleways and footpaths that would have connected them. And by doing that, we can push cars to the edge of the cluster and start pedestrianizing the sort of heart, the historic sort of village cores and stop those rat runs and make these places, make these villages safer places for people to live in and better connected. Uh, and um, another aspect is that when you have this cluster of villages, you naturally create this kind of, there's a central landscape, um, uh, which, which is a, an opportunity to start thinking about how we manage and look after our land differently, build on the biodiversity and wildlife. But perhaps also we were starting to think about how you could have a more productive landscape 
at the edge of this, uh, what we're calling the big back garden, a more productive landscape where um, closer to the villages where people can grow food and begin to become more so self-sufficient. And then perhaps in the middle, have a more active landscape where these footpaths and bridleways, the cycle walking routes crisscross, uh, where there may be more community activities or leisure activities, which could vary depending on the character and the context of each of these village clusters. And so this is about sharing resources, sharing resources through these scalable clusters. Um, so several village clusters might form what we call a town cluster, and that might have a special specialism around tourism or culture, depending on, as I say, where it is. A village cluster can start sharing. Um, one, one village might have the school, another one might have the um, uh, GP. Uh, and this goes right down to the resources you have in a village and also the way you think about housing. We've touched on co-housing and this idea of perhaps lighter footprints um, uh, for houses because you can share more resources, share gardens, share dining bars, those sorts of ideas. Um, and we've tested this out. We've cycled through these villages, met local people and even seen, you know, people beginning to farmers beginning to think differently about the way they diversify. Um, and we've also started thinking about what this new housing might look like, what its typology might be. We've looked at not just the sort of very picturesque small workers' cottages that you see in these villages, but also those quite large agricultural sheds uh, and start looking at how, you know, that we see there as well. Um, it's also very much about um, it being landscape led. Um, and uh, here on the right, we have a diagram of um, the typical housing developments where nearly up to 40% of those sites are dedicated towards roads and parking, whereas we're trying to look at this differently and reduce the need, you know, reduce the car and the need for it uh, and, and, and invest much, much more in the landscape and countryside. And so these, these, these housing topologies that we developed, we see being placed in and around the historical core. This is our imagined village. The historical core is the sort of gray color. The typologies are bringing in new homes of all types, flats, houses, but also how workspaces and, 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 and uh, work live spaces. The orange buildings or the yellowy orange buildings on the edge are what we kind of see as perhaps the depots um, where services and deliveries can come into the edge of the village. Um, and, but the larger vehicles are kept um, out of uh, the middle, which is, is pedestrianized. Um, oh, sorry. and. Um, Yes, yeah, so since winning the uh, National Infrastructure Competition, VeloCity has um, spoken with many government bodies, all sorts of people. We've received research funding to develop our ideas from the RIBA, uh, and we also won the William Sutton Prize. Uh, we've um, looked at people we can partner with. Uh, Brompton um, are very keen to, you know, um, see their bikes being used more in the countryside and look at these more multimodal forms of active travel that we could introduce. and. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so some of our research has allowed us to go and visit uh, and uh, visit case studies. We've been to um, Denmark, Sweden, and actually closer to home, um, we visited a little village uh, in the Yorkshire Dales called Dent, which was surprisingly um, uh, informative. It's it's a historic agricultural village. It's got narrow cobbled streets, but um, and and little and very picturesque uh, housing. But actually, the density is something like sixty eight dwellings per hectare. Um, and, um, and so it's really interesting that this idea of high density uh, isn't necessarily what people think it might be. And the community is very strong there. They've taken all their cars out to the edge. Uh, there's a picture there of the Grass Creek field that sits on the edge. And there's a notice board called the Barn Door, um, uh, which, is that, which is, sort of shows how active they are and has actually got a digital platform by the very same name. So there were lots of lessons to learn from that. Um, and then more recently in the last year or so, we've been working with Blenheim Estate. They're a large landowner um, who own Blenheim Palace just outside Oxford um, and the park and, and a lot of land around that, around that within villages around the palace and park. And we've been developing a, a vision there to, to create better connected villages, perhaps create two new villages and look at growing that community and, yeah, and connecting them better. This has also involved us looking at um, all the potential um, uh, ways that people, you know, the daily routes that people might take in the area and how we can incentivize those um, uh, to create more active travel and use different ways of moving around. 
Uh, and during COVID, um, we were able to trial uh, uh, and open up a route across the Blenheim Park because the cool schools bus service was greatly reduced. Um, and this path enabled school children to cycle much more directly from one side um, uh, of the area to the school in, in Woodstock. And this has uh, really been quite successful and has encouraged more, more paths to start opening up. Um, uh, and also for villagers to start realizing that together they can um, really sort of lobby for more, for more safer um, uh, means of traveling and walking and cycling. Um, and with Blenheim, we recently submitted a proposal to um, Oxfordshire Open Thought. So this is um, Oxford County Council uh, inviting um, people to engage in a process for their 2050 vision. Um, and we submitted the Velo City principles, um, looking much more specifically at the uh, wider Oxfordshire area and actually how you can relieve pressure from the towns um, and start looking um, uh, at uh, better connecting and investing in, in, in these myriads of villages in the area. Uh, and we're also uh, looking at um, uh, a small site in one of the villages to, um, uh, to bring the Velo City principles into a housing uh, of about 40 homes. Um, and this is almost like a micro scale of, our, of, of all our principles uh, being invested in this site. It's, it's right in the heart of the village. Um, uh, it's, uh, we're pushing the cars to the edge. We're running um, a footpath cycle and walking route right through the heart of, of, of the site which is both beneficial to the new homes but also it links some of the other village facilities that are disconnected at the moment via um, quite busy roads um, and um, it, uh, it, it, it's, it's got um, smaller clusters of houses a little bit like our village clusters that are, that, um, are located around shared spaces uh, which are almost like the mini big back gardens. So really interesting, the houses will be passive design, they're taking cues from the local vernacular uh, and the densities are, 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 are higher. Um, and elsewhere, um, you know, Vela City, we're, we're, looking, we're working elsewhere in other parts of the country um, and uh, we're looking at uh, the, um, how you might create village clusters in the Welsh Valleys. Uh, and we're working with um, rail engineers on a project uh, near Bridport, around Bridport which is uh, looking at reversing the Beecham uh, and opening up an old railway line, um, which by the very nature, it was quite a, a wide track to take those bigger trains, but now has that capacity to take a smaller track, uh, a very light rail, and then run alongside it walking and cycling. So this has both tourist benefits, but also the ability to suddenly connect the myriad of little villages along that railway line. Um, uh, and, and, um, and, and yeah, you know, get people sort of cycling and walking to those stations rather than being so reliant on their cars. Um, so yes, we, we think Velo City is scalable uh, and has a wider impact. Uh, it's uh, practical because it actually is low cost. It's reusing existing infrastructure rather than having to build new. It is transformative because it needs to turn planning on its head and we think it's replicable. Um, both across the country, um, or the county, the country, and then possibly, possibly the world. Uh, Sue was talking about how, you know, One Planet Living has had that impact. Who knows, maybe Velo City can too. So um, you can read more about uh, Velo City. We've recently contributed to a chapter in the RIBA Rethink Design Guide, and also the Design Commission for Wales uh, book, uh, Places for Life. Uh, and um, or you could visit our website. Uh, so thank you very much for listening and look forward to a discussion around this. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, two absolutely brilliant presentations there. Uh, I hope everyone got as much out of those uh, as I did. Um, I'd, I'd like to kick off the Q&A. Um, there's been some, some interesting questions in the chat and I'm hoping Charlie will come and start rescuing some of those but if you have questions that you want to put to either of the speakers or just generally um, just ping them in the chat and, and hopefully we'll have a few minutes to to pick those up um, I'd, I'd like to just try and explore with you both the um, the impact of the of the planning system because that's come up in the chat that came up in both your your presentations and trying to understand the extent to which um, the planning system is, is actually hindering uh, good uh, development, de that's development that's, that's 
uh, at least a lot better for for the climate. Um, maybe Sue, if I could if I could start with you. Um, just interested in in the extent, if there was any, that the local plan in Chobham was supporting community led development rather than say you know, the old fashioned model of, you know, if you're doing affordable housing, it must be done by by a housing association. Was, was that an issue for you? Uh, yeah, it's definitely been an issue. Uh, the land is noted as lands come forward for affordable housing in the five year land supply, but um, the council would like to build regular uh, social, or see regular social housing there. So they that's why they objected to our application. Um, but actually, when we talked, what the community want is, you know, they live in the village with their mum. They, they've now got a partner and they can't afford to get a two bedroom home to live in. Um, so and they would like it to be sustainable. So, you know, we've got people who want the homes who live in the community, but the council's offering something that they wouldn't um, fit. But I think things that things are changing a bit I mean I'm not necessarily a big fan of some of these government schemes that always seem to yeah, be badly designed but um, the first homes scheme is going to offer discount market sale housing um, and regular developers are going to be required to provide it for up to 25 percent of their homes um, and the way they see that working is it will affect the land price because I think the key thing for us was if you're going to make it affordable you can't go head to head with Barrett's Although we did for bedstead, actually we literally went head to head with Barrett's. And Sutton Council valued the carbon emission savings and let us bid 20% um, lower for the land in order to make the project happen. But I think a lot of local authorities are very cash strapped and they should be taking into account social value. Uh, and there's actually an act for that. Um, and at the moment it's voluntary, um, but, uh, I'm not saying the people at Surrey Heath Council are awful, they're just in a system and that's how the system works, but there are some changes coming. Uh, and so we hope that the planning inspector will recognise uh, the need. That's our sort of key plank of our argument uh, for the uh, planning appeal later in the month. So I don't know, did I answer your question there? Yeah, Chris? no, great. And, a, and another really important point there from Sue about um, actually local authorities have a duty to take into account environmental and social benefits. The Treasury Green Book tells them to. They're just really bad at doing it. They don't really understand how to do it and they don't really want to do it because they want the cash. Um, but that's always a lever we can we can try and pull. Um, Sue, so just, just another one on, on Chobham. Um, again, you know, the system that you referred to and, and the local plan where was that on parking? Was it was it requiring a minimum number or did it allow you to do what you wanted to do? No, they did make us push the parking up. So the way we handled that was we made a sort of community marketplace area almost like you could have, go and have your parties there. You could have events like we do here at Bedstead and use that, um, that sort of, it's concrete, but it lets the grass grow through That's and sort of have... Meanwhile, parking almost, you know, that if we really need it, there is more parking there. They did actually insist on us upping the parking. Yeah. Did you, did you use finally the same thing, Sarah, um, in relation to Velo City? Is, uh, is the idea of villages without cars or without private cars um, anathema to the planners or are you getting support? I think actually the work we're doing with Blenheim um, and uh, working with the um, Oxfordshire County Council and West Oxford District Council, they've actually been really supportive. They're very interested uh, in, 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 you know, uh, trying to invest more in the villages. Um, uh, as, as I think I mentioned, they see um, that they've used all the good land and bad land around towns um, to create more housing. And it's just, uh, it's just escalating in terms of uh, congestion on roads um, and uh, and it's 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 you know we still see more and more people in villages having to jump in their cars to get to these places where these service centers so um, we've had quite a lot of support from them at ways in which to to help you know to start for them to start investing less in roads and more in the cycle and walking paths um, uh, and um, 
And yes, there is pressure to create a minimum number of houses and cars, but it's also trying to think about future proofing and what those spaces and, and, and I think as Sue's saying, you know, if you do put it on a grass creek or put it on somewhere on the edge of the village, what that can then turn into at a later stage when, you know, car sharing or, um, uh, you know, and, and less, less dependency on the private car means less cars and how, how, how those spaces can transform and be utilised by, by the village and by the communities there. Um, mm. There is, of course, yeah, there's a course you, resistance. You, Carry on. I, I, was, I was going to ask if you had any re reaction to the proposition you mentioned at the end to Oxfordshire yeah. about the kind of long term. You know, do, do you think... Um, planning authorities will get to the place where you know for example they're allocating specific sites purely for um private car free community-led development for example private car free did you say yeah so not <laughs> car free but but oh, know, potentially car, car club yes, yes. rather than privately owned I do think so. I think so. I think we're finding that we're having really positive discussions with them. They've got these cycle champions that are involved at quite high level discussions about how we can implement um, proper cycle and walking routes um, that link villages to train stations. I mean, around the areas we're working, you're literally one mile away from a train station. There's a number of um, rail lines, not just not just the station at Oxford or, 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 or Parkway. There are smaller stations which, with further investment, mean it's possible for people to quite easily walk and cycle. Uh, um, but it's just getting those routes in place. You know, at the moment there's pathetic, very small, badly paved, you know, um, uh, sidewalks for in places, but they're disconnected um, and uh, they're shared with cars. Um, so, I, as I say, I think this idea of um, perhaps working with someone like Blenheim, a large landowner who has got a bit of clout and has a lot of the land that some of these routes go across, is a way forward for councils, um, for the local authorities to um, better connect and therefore be able to invest and, and see more housing happen in villages mm. in a much more sustainable way. Thanks. So can I just have a last one for Sue and then maybe, Charlie, if you've got something out of the chat, you could, you could come in. Um, so we're just interested um, in your thoughts about how you're going to deal with the upfront carbon at, at, at Chobham. You know, are you, because I think it's quite wooded, isn't it, the site? Are you able to reuse the wood or what, what are your thoughts? And, and again, with the planning system, is it is it supporting you in any way, encouraging you to do these sorts of things? Uh, I would say no, the planning system is not encouraging us at all. <laughs> um, but yes. Uh, we want to use, in fact, we're hoping to use Ian's product, the, uh, which is, uh, so you get the, the wood panels, which makes it easier because it's a wooded site, it's going to be difficult to, because most of the trees are on the outside, so the one lovely tree we've got to cut down, we're going to turn it into a piece of a seat and some art and some pergolas and use it there. Um, and then um, we're, we're looking to use uh, wood panels uh, with the hemp and lime inside um, and looking at other panels. There's always, um, it's difficult for Ian because, you know, they can only go so far out and we're just slightly on the edge in Chobham. Um, but definitely going for wood uh, panels and, and off-sites, manufacturing for a part of it and also going for more of a custom build approach. And I think custom build is another way that you can sort of tick the boxes with local authorities. Uh, in terms of they need to get people off the custom build register. Um, so uh, that's a sort of another element to our scheme and making the home sort of fit for lifetime use that you can, you know, when they come to be, you know, say you get old and you need a downstairs bathroom, that the way it's designed, you can just move the wall backwards or forwards, just one internal wall, um, and that the homes can be designed for, the, for what people need right now uh, as they're built as well. Another, another, really, another really great point there from Sue about the custom build register, because actually community led housing is one way of local authorities sorting out um, their obligations under right to build. Uh, Charlie, do you want to come in with something from the um, chat? Well, there's a question from Angela around, is there a minimum number of homes? This is probably more aimed at Sue, a minimum number of homes that an enabling developer would be interested in uh, before mm. they would work with you? Yeah. <laughs> um, annoyingly, it has to be sort of, I mean, bedside is a hundred homes. I didn't sort of give you the full details on that. 
So we're sort of looking something between 20, 30, I'd even more like 30, children is 30, up to 100. And it could be it's part of a bigger scheme. So that's also happening that some people have been contacting us and they've got quite a big site. And so the whole site wouldn't be for community-led housing and for this particular model, but it could be a proportion of it as well. Great, thanks. And we had one question that came in uh, oh, before all this awesome. with the, the subscriptions. Sorry, were you going to say something else? I was only going to say that for, we are actually working with a, co, a housing co-op, me, you, well, Transition by Design and by Regional, are currently helping a housing co-op that's only looking to do about 10 uh, for a refurb. So that's possible with grants. And that's more of, instead of being the enabling developer, we're, we're advising and applying for grants and support to, to get it funded. So that's another way. Great. Um, and one that came in in the uh, subscriptions to this event was how can professionals get involved within with community-led housing projects um, without spending years and years and years offering loads and loads of free time um, and coming to meetings? I, I don't know if anyone's going to, maybe Sarah, if you've got any thoughts on if you've managed to navigate that successfully. Well, we haven't um, directly necessarily got involved uh, in um, yet in community housing groups as such, but but clearly as professionals, we have been investing an awful lot of time, um, unpaid time, I suppose, in trying to further this and um, and get involved with community uh, groups um, and networks. So, uh, which is very challenging because we're also all got very busy day jobs, you know, um, doing the various different things we do within Velo City, within the individuals of Velo City. So it's very much um, appreciated when we can uh, get research funding, as, as I discussed, you know, as I mentioned, um, from, well, the William Sutton Fund and uh, the Reba to, to help us develop this and, and have these, um, you know, have this uh, wider dialogue um, with people mm -hmm. at all levels, really. Um, um, so we just had a we just had a few meetings working with the architects design meetings you know and people didn't necessarily come to everyone and there are some who are like stalwarts of the group and you know the chair and really more involved and others who were like I'd like to live there I'm going to come and get involved in the designs and then leaving it with us and then we just keep in touch uh, while we're waiting for the planning um, and when we did bed said a lot of people got in touch and said oh, i really want to live there and then by the time it happened they'd actually found had to move away if you if you need to move if you need a home you need it then and the whole thing takes so long mm -hmm. through the system that people often have moved on and that's actually happened with sustaining Chobham. uh that a few people have moved on but new people have appeared <laughs> um so i think the good work's been done on the design by because it's got that local insight and you know there's not that many uh, ways that are different ways you can build homes so they'll they'll be happy with them and you know people move in and out here at bedstead and new people come and you think oh they'll never be as great as the old people and they are a tip from me would be to get an architect in your group and um, we're working with uh, uh in fact three three co-housing groups um, and they all have architects in fact one That's has three architects in the group yeah They've always got great ideas. And, you know, they put the love into it. I think that's the key thing. This needs to be a work of love and attention to get really wonderful communities. I wouldn't want to work on a project unless I'd like to live there myself. And, you know, these things are important, but often overlooked. For that person asking about, they, they were an architect themselves looking to get involved. And so I've got a direct answer to that, which is we often bring the funding to the schemes so that we can get paid so we're on lots of lists we get paid by a number of different organizations to help groups so that they don't have to find the funding first that's one good way of being able to stand up and give some proper time to this yeah. um we have finished this session there's a great question about uh, fire safety that i wanted to bring in but we'll have to cover it in the next bit so if we just take a, a few minutes off uh we'll come back at 11 and then i'll introduce the uh the three brief breakout groups and, and what they're going to be about Thank you to our speakers for this session and to Chris for, for fielding the questions. And, and I'll see you in three minutes at 11. Just have a bit of a shake and uh, turn, your, turn your camera off for a moment.